Hey everybody, and welcome to the sixth episode of the Level Creation Guide for Half-Life. In the previous episode, we learned about trigger entities and how to use them to create unique events to occur in our levels. In this episode, we're going back to the basics of room building, but instead of building an indoor room, we're going to be learning how to create an outdoor area. Creating outdoor areas is not all that different from creating an indoor one. However, the main difference is the amount of extra detail outdoor areas require in order to look more natural and convincing. In order for us to achieve this, we're going to have to learn about a couple new tools, textures, and entities this episode. Let's begin by creating a simple outdoor room. Create a 512 by 512 room with the walls being 364 units tall and the thickness of the walls being 64 units. Let's not forget to texture our room with the null texture as well. Then texture the walls with the rock texture and the floor with the sand texture. Let's also not forget to add an info player start entity as well. Now, in order to make this room outdoors, the only thing we truly need to do is add a sky instead of a ceiling. To do this, we're going to have to use another of Jack's special textures called the Sky Texture. This texture will render a 3D sky to whatever it's textured to. This is how Half-Life creates all its skies in the game. Let's select our ceiling and apply the Sky Texture to every face by selecting the Sky Texture on the right side of Jack and pressing the Apply Texture button. Click on this button above the viewports to toggle on our sky in the 3D view. There we go. To change what sky our level uses, go to the Map tab and select Map Properties. A window will appear and allow us to change the basic information about our level. We can add a name, a chapter title appearance, level fade in, and of course, change the 3D sky appearance. Select the Environment Map option to choose which sky to use. There are several options to choose from such as Nighttime Skies, Daytime, and Zen ones as well. For our level, I'm going to use the Desert Sky option and add a chapter title named Outdoor Test. Our sky is almost set and ready to go. All we need to do is create a new entity called the Light Environment Entity. This entity gives our sky the ability to produce light, and without this entity, our level would be completely dark. Unlike most entities, the entity position does not matter, so place it wherever you desire. The light environment entity has only three important settings to adjust, the compass direction, the pitch direction, and the brightness slash color settings. We can use these settings to alter our sky from being from daylight to nighttime. The compass direction allows us to change what direction the light is coming from and corresponds to the top viewport. I'm going to set this to 90. The pitch direction is the angle of the light's direction, and depending on what direction you choose, the pitch will correspond either with the side or front viewports. To find out which viewport the pitch is corresponding with, reference the info player start Gordon Freeman and the viewports. Compare his positioning in the top viewport with the front and side viewports in order to find which viewport the pitch is corresponding with. In our test level, the pitch corresponds to the front viewport. Let's choose 45 degrees so that the light will be shining downwards at an angle. The brightness setting has four sets of numbers. The first three sets are for color, which we can use the pick color option to adjust the color of the light, and the last set is for the brightness. Since I chose the desert 3D sky, which looks to be in the daytime, I'm going to set the color of light to light yellow and our brightness to 800. If we wanted to create a nighttime level, all we would need to do is change its color to a darker blue and lower its brightness to around 200. We would also probably want to change our 3D sky to a nighttime sky. Our sky has everything it needs, and we are ready to playtest this. Press F9 to compile and test our sky in-game. Awesome work. Our sky is working properly and looks great.
Now that our sky is all set up, let's continue transforming this room into a more convincing outdoor area continuing with the floor. To make this floor into believable terrain, we're going to have to revisit the old block tool. While the block tool is mainly used to create blocks, it can also create other useful shapes such as the wedge, cylinder, spike, sphere, rock, and arch. If we select the block tool and click on the drop down box located on the right side of Jack, it will display all seven shapes. For this episode, we're just going to be focusing on the cylinder, spike, and rock shapes. Let's start out by creating and using the spike shape. The spike shape might not look like it can be used for anything but for placing at the bottom of pits, but this shape can be used to make uneven terrain. Let's begin by selecting the block tool and using the drop down list to select the spike shape. Right below the drop down box you will see a number of faces option. This option controls how many sides our spike will have. Increasing this will make a more detailed shape. Let's set this option to 6. Start out by drawing out a 64 by 64 unit spike in the top viewport. Don't be fooled by the square shape of the outline. This is normal for every shape to be drawn out as a square in the three grid viewports. Once ready, press enter and our spike will be built. Our spike is looking more like a cone now. This is good. Texture this cone with the null texture and lower its height until it's barely above ground height. Then, use the advanced texture tool, click on our sand floor, and right click it on each face of the flat cone. Be sure to make any adjustments to the alignment options to make this cone blend in with our sand floor. And there you have it, we've successfully created a very basic bump in our terrain. There are plenty of things we can do with this shape to add to our terrain, such as the following. We can place multiple of these around our terrain, such as around the edges. We can retexture it as a rock or other terrain texture to give the illusion that there's something beneath the sand. And we can increase the size and height of this cone to cover a larger portion of the ground. Pretty cool, right? The last thing we can do to make this shape more convincing and realistic is by using another of Jack's tools called the Vertex tool. But before we can ask what this tool does, what is a vertex? A vertex is a point of where two lines meet. For example, in the top down view, a square has four vertex points, and in a 3D view, it has eight vertex points. The vertex tool allows us to adjust the position of these vertex points in all four viewports. Let's use the vertex tool. Select a cone and click on the vertex tool icon. As you can see, the vertex points are all revealed and are ready for us to adjust them. To adjust these points, simply click on each point or drag click to select multiple. Once selected, click hold and pull them away from the other vertex points. You will see that our cone is becoming less and less conform and more random. Let's do this with each of the vertex points of this cone, including the cone top vertex point as well. But as a warning, I recommend being very careful when using the vertex tool. This tool is very powerful and can create some really interesting complex shapes. However, some of these shapes can be created only in Jack and cannot be reproduced in game. Be very small in your adjustments at first, and do not pull lines over lines like so until you have a good understanding of what you're trying to create. The next shape we're going to be learning about is the rock. Not that rock. This shape is an exclusive shape to the Jack level editor and randomly generates a rock shaped block. This tool is really handy when adding last details to an outdoor level. Let's create a rock shape by selecting the block tool and choosing the rock shape from the drop down box. To use the rock shape effectively, we must first map out our block in all viewports before pressing enter. If we don't do it this way, our block will be generated at those angles and will not look proper if ever readjusted. So it's best to adjust it fully before creating. I'm going to place this rock in the corner and adjust it to get its best viewing angles. Don't feel afraid to place it into the ground to make it more flat to the ground if you're having troubles.
Let's also duplicate this and place it in front of the original at a different viewing angle. And that should be it. The last shape we're going to be learning about is the cylinder shape. Cylinders are usually used for creating barrels, pipes, and fillers, but for our outdoor level, we're going to be using it to create a pit with water. Create a cylinder by clicking on the block tool icon and selecting the cylinder shape from the drop down box. Keep the faces at 8 and draw out an 192 by 192 block with the thickness being 128. Position it somewhere in the middle of our outdoor area and press enter to create. Now that we have our cylinder, let's reposition it into the floor and use the vertex tool to pull each of its vertices to create a more natural shape for our pit opening. Now that our pit shape is complete, we need to hollow it out. A very easy way to make any block hollow without having to use any tools is by simply selecting the block, right clicking on it, and clicking on the make hollow option. A window will appear asking us how thick in units we want the walls, floors, and ceilings of this pit to be when hollowed out. We can make this number negative to make the walls, floors, and ceiling be built outward instead of inside the pit. We won't need to make the numbers negative for our pit, so let's just use 8 units thick. Press OK and our block will be hollowed out. You will see that our pit has been divided up into small blocks. They are all grouped together, so we're going to need to ungroup them by selecting our pit and pressing Ctrl U. Now let's carve it into the ground by selecting our pit, then right clicking it and selecting the carve option. Once carved, let's delete the lid part of our pit and move the inside block out for later use. Let's then pull each of our pit walls up to the floor height. Because we carved the block, some of the walls may not be the same size as the rest, so I'm going to be safe and adjust them one at a time. Now that we've finished adjusting the walls, texture all of the blocks of our pit with a null texture. Lastly, texture all the faces that the player will see with the appropriate textures. There we go, our pit is almost complete. All we need to do is add water to it. Let's grab our block we moved earlier and place it back into the pit. Texture this block with a water texture and extend it to the bottom of the pit. Let's also be sure to make our water not floor level, but around 16 to 24 units below floor level. In order to make this water block behave and act like water, we're going to need to transform it into a function entity called Funk Water. The function water entity allows the player to see through the water when swimming and gives the water wave animations. While Funk Water may have a lot of options displayed, the only unique ones are Contents and Wave Height. Contents are used for different liquid types. Slime and Lava adds instant death damage. Of course, this should only be paired with a slime or lava texture, unless you want to be evil, but since we want water, we're going to leave this on the water setting. And the Wave Height is how high the animation of the wave water can reach. This setting depends on how close our water is to the floor, so we'll just leave this setting to just one. Awesome work! Our water pit is complete, along with the rest of our terrain. Now that we've finished our floor terrain, let's move on to the last part of this episode, which will be about the rock walls of our outdoor area. In Half-Life, most of the outdoor areas are surrounded by cliffs, which makes sense since Half-Life takes place in New Mexico. But how the heck are we going to turn this into this? No need to worry. This may seem like a difficult feat, but there's a really simple and neat trick that doesn't require being Howard Rourke or Michelangelo to use. Let's begin by resizing the northern wall and the top viewport to 64 units tall and 64 units wide, with the thickness being 64 units. 
Texture this block with a null texture and then texture its front face with a rock texture. In order for us to continue, we are going to now need to cut this block in half. To do this, we're going to need the help of another of Jack's special tools called the clipping tool. The clipping tool allows us to cut blocks in the top, side, and front viewports. It's an incredibly useful tool and is used frequently. Let's use this tool to cut this block in half by selecting our clip block and pressing on the clipping tool icon. Using the side viewport, click drag onto the selected block in any direction. A line will appear separating our block with two small white circles. The 3D view will also show this line, and it is a good reference to see what direction of the cut. We can use these white circles to adjust where we can cut the block. We can also use the bracket keys to make the grid smaller or larger for more precise cuts. There is also two sides created, a red and white side. The red side will be deleted when we press enter to cut, and the white side will remain. We can switch what side to cut by pressing shift x. Shift x has three options, cut this side, or that side, or don't cut both. Keep pressing Shift X to rotate between these options. For this block, let's cut it into two wedges. Move the white circles across the block so they are positioned from the bottom left up to the top right. Make sure both sides are white by using Shift X, and when ready, press Enter to cut. We have successfully cut our first block. Let's control group both sides of this block by selecting both blocks and pressing Control G. This will make it easier to select later. Now that we've cut this block, we're going to need to make an entire wall of these blocks. Let's duplicate this block and create 8 rows and 5 columns with it. To do this, select the block, hold shift, and drag it away from the original. Keep repeating this process until we have 8 across the bottom. Select all 8 of our blocks, control group them by pressing control G, and stack them up until we have 5 columns. When finished, select all the blocks and control group them. Now that our wall is built and control group, this is where this neat trick really shines. Be sure to follow along very closely, as this part is a little technical. Select our cliff wall and press on the vertex tool icon. Start out by using the top viewport and grab small portions of the front row vertices. Hold them forward at varying sizes to create depth, and remember to use the bracket keys to make the grid size smaller or larger for more size variance options. Use the 3D view for a reference as well when seeing and trying to make adjustments. Once done in the top viewport, use the front viewport and do the same. Pull small portions of wall left to create varying depths. Be small and careful in the adjustments, or else using Ctrl Z will cause the entire vertex adjustments to be reverted. Once satisfied with the cliff look, click on the selection tool icon to finish using the vertex tool. Pretty cool trick, right? While it might seem complicated at first, it's by far the easiest way I know how to create clips. All we need to do now is readjust the textures by making them all the same settings in the Advanced Texture tool. I like to put the scale of the X and Y values to 2.0. This will make the rock texture look less concentrated and larger. Let's not forget to pull our info player start forward out of the cliff. Let's delete the other walls and replace them with duplicates of this cliff wall. We're going to have to do some further vertex adjustments to make all our cliff walls connect so no leaks are made. This may take some time. Lastly, let's add a sky behind our clips. And that should be it. Press F9 to compile and test it out in-game. Congratulations, you've learned how to create an outdoor area. Thank you so much for watching the video, and I hope you enjoyed this extra long episode.
If you have any questions, be sure to let me know down in the comments, and I'll try my best to help. I hope to see you next time in the seventh episode of the Level Creation Guide for Half-Life.